proprietary storage versus open storage. We're seeing an evolution today in storage. And how that evolution is occurring is really interesting and it's really going to impact what you decide to purchase over the next few years. Joining me to help with that conversation, I've invited Scott Ryan. Scott is the Senior Vice President at Concurrent. Scott, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let's dive into this, Scott. Um, we got proprietary storage and open storage. I, I'm assuming that that's a proprietary stack we're starting with there, right? Yeah, I mean, just at a very simple level, there, there's a software part of the stack and a hardware part of the stack. And, you know, the world that we're living in and have traditionally been living in is, is you know, proprietary hardware functions that are built, you know, with proprietary software, uh, vendor-specific software on top. Right. All, all provided from one guy uh, and he got to know you real well and brought you lunch a lot of times, right? Exactly, yeah. and someone that you were then stuck with for years then trying to live out the life of that storage system. Right, and then the next step we saw is sort of what I think a lot of people call software-defined storage, which was software running on, you know, kind of opening up the stack just a little bit, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, first and foremost, what people have wanted to see is, you know, commercial off-the-shelf hardware, right, or COTS hardware. Mm -hmm. So, um, making this part of the stack open has been, you know, going on for at least 10 years now or, sure. or longer and then what people have done is they've then put you know SDS or software defined storage on it but but the fact is it's still proprietary software that's uh, sitting on top of COTS hardware so it's a move in the right direction but right and I but I think the big challenge with this uh, software so to your point right gives us a little bit more flexibility but the the challenge here is that if you and I decide we're going to write our own uh, storage software we got to write it and then we got to find a whole bunch of people to test it. People tend to be really sensitive about their data and they don't want it deleted, right? right. So getting that through that process and getting enough uh, of a footprint is really kind of difficult, right? Yeah, and I think um, not it doesn't change the market that much, right? So so even though it's commercial off-the-shelf hardware, it's not like you can bring in a new vendor and say, oh, I just bought all this other hardware to run this other software. Now I want to take your software and put it on top of it for, for two reasons. One, one is just the uh, performance specifications of the, of the COTS hardware and may not fit what the new vendor wants. Right. And the second part is exactly what you mentioned as well. The data types, uh, how data is saved on the storage system may be completely different. And so just because you're coming in and putting new software in there is you're going to end up creating a storage migration process which uh, most people want to avoid right now the final step where we're really starting to see people take off is sort of this open storage concept so and that kind of opens the umbrella even further right right so now I mean you're still working with uh, commercial off-the-shelf hardware that um, is you know becomes the basis of what uh, people will run you know uh, open source software on but now you can take a new stack uh, that sits on top of here of software um, that's completely open um, open source and or has open APIs and open standards to be able to, to run uh, differently. So. And, and so some examples of, of guys that are in that open storage space would be like uh, Ceph, Gluster, uh, Swift Stack. Swift, stuff those, like. those are the big ones, right? I mean, there's hundreds of them actually, but right. when you really look at where the popular activity is, Ceph is um, you know, first and foremost the most active community of, of, of new commits as well as uh, active um, active uh, users of the software, um, followed uh, by Gluster and then Swift okay. in this space. And, and then I think, so the big advantage here is that, that, that if, you, if you go that route, now you do get the benefit of, you could be a brand new vendor, so to speak, to the space, and now get the benefit of years worth of testing and thousands of installations, right? Yeah, I mean, actually, clearly we've seen an explosion in the past few years with software-defined storage with new startups, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's good for the industry, it's good for the buyer, more choice. There's been a tremendous amount of venture capital thrown into that business over the past 10 years. What the vast majority of it's been thrown into is proprietary software uh, development. Right. You know, like, like you said, what you end up with is if you're one of the first few customers out of the gate with that with that new SDS vendor, um, then you're now testing all their brand new software. With in the open source world, clearly uh, something like SAF or Gluster has been out for quite a while. It's been tested and hammered upon by right. thousands of applications, tens of thousands of, of users, and uh, you know tens of thousands of, of uh, terabytes or probably petabytes in the case of SAF that are actually under management already. Right, and and so these guys might enhance sort of the, the periphery around here, right? But that core component is the thing that's really been well vetted, right? Yeah, so the core part, what we sort of think of, so um, so our system, the concurrent system that we built called Aquary, actually uses an open source engine at the base of it. Okay. And our open source engine is Ceph. Um, what Ceph is really good at is what we call the data primitive. So um, handling things like, I want to do a snapshot, I want to handle, I want to do a block, or I want to do an object. Right. Um, I want those objects to be able to uh, be randomly spread across multiple disks, 
defining failure domains, all those basic functions that you want within a storage system. Now, if you want to be able to schedule a snapshot to happen every Sunday during a particular change control window that you have, or you want you know, very uh, rapid snapshots, more like CDP or something, that's not built into Ceph. Um, you have to build software on top of that to be able to um, make that happen. So gotcha. uh, hence why we think of Ceph really as the core engine. And so having that part be open source, that's the part that everyone's always worried about. That's why people are so uh, risk averse to moving away from this traditional sure. stack because they want to make sure their data is uh, protected and, and, um, and using uh, well-known methods to, to protect and secure their data. Yeah. Now let me throw you a curveball here. So one of the complaints I often hear in this space I'm curious to see what you, how you guys address this. Is it it is open? It's like mm -hmm. an erector set. And now I got to got to put it together. And I think one of the reasons that this remains kind of popular is IT guys aren't getting less busy, right? They're stretched thin. So so how do you resolve that issue? Right. So I mean, the the one thing people always you know tend to try to equate you know open source. You know somehow open source means cheap, right? Right. And um and I think the reality is that's not true. So the the fact is it's um it's inexpensive to get started because the license fees up front tend to be lower cost. But what um, tends to happen with open source is that you, you really shift the dollars. So the dollars, instead of being kind of upfront dollars, um, get, get shifted out to being uh, kind of total cost of ownership type dollars okay. and the way you operate, uh, operationalize the use of that uh, erector set of software. And that is very true. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable complaint about uh, open source in general across all infrastructure open source projects from things like HA proxy, Squid proxy, you know, ATS, other things, that Nginx that people know of. Um, they are, tend to be very esoteric software that are very difficult to understand. And Ceph is not immune to that. Uh, particular problem as well. And what we've done with Aquari is we have built software on top of the, the base um, open source software of Ceph to make the total cost of ownership of it much lower, making it easier to install, easier to configure correctly, which is sort of a notorious problem. Um, in fact, they're one of the big distros of, of OpenStack notes that the number one call center issue they have is actually not OpenStack related, it's actually Ceph, Ceph. storage related. Sure. So um, making that uh, easier to properly configure yourself um, there are somewhere between depending on how you define them 72 to 150 settings that need to be properly put in there that even the most sophisticated um, uh, IT departments and storage admin groups will struggle making certain that they've got the right uh, settings uh, not because they don't know what they're doing but in some ways again the settings are very esoteric to understand you know uh, what should my IO buffer queue be for this kind of application that I'm sure. using uh, and ones that I may use in the future and then you guys kind of uh, walk them through that or address that. Way. So we, we handled it on the on uh, the way we uh, do built the storage system to begin with to install properly. Um, a big part of our focus is on media related uh, storage, and so right out of the box we have settings that are uh, well uh, appropriated for uh, either media processing or media delivery. Um, we also have the uh, you know, sort of drop-down mo uh, menu type simplicity to be able to select other types of applications that we've qualified with. Um, so you may be doing backup with Commvault or maybe doing a sync and share application okay. with a simplicity. We have settings associated uh, with each one of those that um, change the way the software operates to be able to um, make the system uh, truly multi-workload. So I can get into like your guys' type of solution, take advantage of this, but I don't have to necessarily at least day one become a Ceph expert. That's that's right. So we'll help, uh, help people along in that journey uh, on Ceph expertise. We don't change anything, and, and this would be an important thing if you are looking at open source storage as an option within your environment. You want to make certain that people actually aren't modifying the open source. So if for whatever reason you want to get rid of that vendor, you know, and hopefully with our customers that doesn't happen. Right. But if they did, um, we haven't touched the core open source uh, engine. So you can always come back in without generating a, a data migration, without changing the way data has been laid onto the uh, system, you could actually bring a different vendor in or uh, decommission our software and still be able to use the open source system to access your data. Great, so then that's the real value with, with this is it gives you that one level, another step level of flexibility. Right, and I think in, in a lot of ways it's sometimes hard for people to even conceptualize that. That concept of being able to manage my storage as well as handle the data primitives has sort of been bundled into this whole uh, stack, even in both of these stacks. And what part of the um, maybe un 
unintended consequence of the way these open source projects work today mm -hmm. is that because they only handle the data primitives, the management plane has become something very different. And I think it's very interesting and very useful as you look at new type of cloud orchestrated environments, you know, how open source storage can fit into those, that kind of part of the world. Great, well Scott, thanks for helping us out today. Thanks for having me. So there you have it. Uh, Software-defined storage has been slow to kind of eat its way through into the market, and one of the challenges has been this level of flexibility, and kind of that ultimate inflexibility has been its own challenge because there is so much flexibility. So what you want to look for is a vendor that has taken care of a lot of that for you so you can move to data quicker. Thanks for joining us. I'm George Crump, Lead Analyst with Storage Switzerland.